exactly one year ago, I was getting off a boat 26 days to Antarctica. And I was still in South America this time last year. I had bought a car in Santiago, Chile, drove up to Peru, met with Nassim Harriman and Brian Forrester, who is speaking here at the conference, and did all the megaliths. So what I'll talk about in my presentation is how we're rethinking the making and transportation of the megaliths. And then as I was driving down to Oshuaia to catch the boat to Antarctica, a sailboat no less, 26 oh. days on a sailboat, and we got terribly ill on the Drake Passage going down. I think I lost about 20 pounds on that trip. Crash course diet, if you ever want to lose weight in a hurry, go, to the, go along the Drake. But as I was going down, we were uh, looking into the uh, escaped Nazis along the lines of hunting Hitler. The hit show on the History Channel went to the Eden Hotel, went to Bariloche, tried to find the uh, house that Hitler lived in near Bariloche. And it's very difficult to get to. We kind of got overlooking the bay where it's at. It's about the closest you can get. A lot of buzz about Antarctica and UFOs. Oh, yeah. Are you part of that buzz? I'm part of that buzz. George, as far as I know, I'm the only researcher that's gone down there with the expressed purpose of looking into some of these claims. And while a lot of them, people just didn't know about it or perhaps weren't talking about them, one of the research stations that was Argentinian called Brown Base on the Palmer Peninsula, they had said that the month before, so this would have been 14 months ago, there was a mass sighting over the Belgrano II base. And I brought that up in my presentation on Monday. Reason. They had seen craft, they have seen orbs, and they were very reluctant to tell us. And that's kind of why I think this may be an authentic claim, hearing it secondhand, because they heard from their colleagues at another base. They said they, that it was a mass sighting. And this is in East Antarctica, not far from where the Germans claim the new Schwabenland territory. So that would be on my top of the list to go back to that part of Antarctica. So right you think the things that are being seen down there are man-made? I, can't, man I cannot discern whether they are man-made or not. One of the sites that I show is in East Antarctica again at the Conan base. And when I was doing my preliminary research before going down there, on Google Earth in 2013, you see this massive structure under the ice. Then they put a tarp over it and you just see the tent pole tarp where it is now. But it's the exact same GPS coordinates for the Conan base, a West German base. And George, the Germans never left after World War II. They kept West German bases and they're still there now as a unified Germany. So that was something interesting I found because I got some National Geographic maps from the Cold War era. West Germany has the Neumeyer base on the coast and the Conan base inland, and that's where this craft is under the ice. And remote viewers, Courtney Brown and the Farsight Institute, they just remote viewed this site and they say it is definitely not some man, uh, natural structure, that it is human made or ET made, nobody knows, but there are massive ca uh, cavities within that structure. You have gotta really commit to, to the research if you're gonna take a sailboat trip to Antarctica. You're absolutely right, <laughs> and it was completely financed by myself, so even more so. I'd go down there again with a film crew, and I do know where Point 211 is, where the New Berlin base. Love to go down there with Geiger counters to see if Project Argus in the late 1950s, all those high altitude, uh, still top secret nuclear explosions if they hit this area. Um, tell me this, how, how does that research that you're pursuing now fit into the larger picture of the modern esoteric, the trio of books <clears throat> that you've been writing? Well, the, it's esoteric studies because right. it is not in line with what we're being told. So these are hidden subjects that uh, I find so fascinating as do you, that we can lump in UFO studies, we can lump in antediluvian civilizations, which is also presumed to be under the ice, and you can also include the mystery schools of old and the secret societies of today, because these are subjects that we're not being told about. So when I went down to Antarctica, it was specifically to try to find if there was veracity in some of these claims that there was a craft under the ice, that there were pyramids sticking through, that antediluvian civilizations or giants or megafauna being pulled out from under the ice. 
Do you think they are there? They're under the ice? Well, as I mentioned with the craft, I think this is the best claim for one of the three uh, craft under the ice, the one in the Conan base. Corey Good says he witnessed the uh, archaeological digs, but he has no photos to back it up. So I was mostly going for hard evidence or firsthand experience. The other thing I came away with is there is absolutely no doubt a giant no-fly zone near the South Pole. And this is where Admiral Byrd flew over and said there was an entryway into the hollow earth. Some say his diaries are faked, but other people say they're authentic. So we just have to be our own researchers and look at some of that evidence. When you see a video like TikTok, is that something that we built? Uh, I don't know. It's difficult to say just from something like a gun camera picture. Do we but have, have an, do we have the ability to uh, to create anti-gravity, uh, to have a machine that flies on anti-gravity principles? Well, you've uh, explained how it can be done. Yeah, right? I, I explain. I sort of reverse engineer um, and based like the B two bomber, I reverse engineered uh, the uh, Project Sky Vault, which again is one of our de developments, and it seems it wasn't based on reverse engineering UFOs in that case. Uh, Tompkins mentions in his book, you know, uh, uh, Chosen by, ex by Extraterrestrial, something like that is the title, uh, about uh, spaceships being built on Earth that we were building and designing one kilometer, two kilometers, three kilometers long. and. Uh, somehow they had to get up in space, and I believe the Project Sky Vault, which I describe in my book in Chapter 7, <coughs> in Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion, was how they got them up there. <coughs> they use microwave beams, which are able to exert a force. It's a special kind of beam, use what's called metamaterials. And Boeing, actually, is one of the producers. It was right in Scientific American, metamaterial. They talk about being a material with what they call negative refractive index, which happens to be a kind of material that if you sh push a, shine a beam of microwaves on it, it's going to push it, so it creates thrust. So uh, they basically had these units on the ships, on the things they put together, and maybe at night boosted them into space. Uh, they, Tompkins says they were built in Utah, in the mountains, secret facility. You believe that? Well, he seems like he's a, a credible person because he was a, a Douglas Aircraft, that it's, can be established, and he was in secret projects. And uh, they say we never would have gotten to the moon if it wasn't for uh, the uh, innovations that he made, like the theater screen at NASA for seeing everything with many screens at once, uh, using like hermetically sealed. Uh, rooms to assemble the rockets. You've been able to, on your own, reverse engineer some of these kinds of te technologies and craft. Yeah. Do you believe our government has been doing the same thing? I think it, you find that likely. Yeah, now, uh, of course, they, they try to, you know, they, they come out of standard physics, and then they try to develop their own physics to kind of understand these, because it's not explained by, standard, by Einstein's theory. And, in fact, there's a lot of evidence against general relativity. For one thing, it doesn't explain electrogravitics, why gravity is connected with uh, electricity. Um, now, I've developed a theory that uh, does explain all these things, and I use that, that's my secret, so to speak, that I have. Your secret sauce. That, that help <laughs> is my theory. With that, I'm able to understand these technologies and explain them. And could you build one of these things? Do you think somebody could build one yeah, you know, based on your model? I've told people, you know, give me 50 million and I can build a few of these things. But and what would they be able to do? What would these craft be capable of? <clears throat> well, I, I don't know about building some of this stuff that the military would be interested in to jump around real quickly like that. They're interested in uh, fighting, maybe fighter craft. 
They'll definitely get us off the earth. And uh, for certain to, stuff we've got right now, I'm working with a fellow Nasikas in uh, Greece. He's got a thruster, a magnetic thruster. <clears throat> you put this in space and it will self-accelerate. And uh, you put a whole bunch of these thrusters, once you get it in space, put a, assemble a rocket, let's say, with all these thrusters on it, and you could go to Mars in uh, a few weeks, not nine months or whatever they talk about it. Five days even could be a possibility. When you first saw the video of the Tic Tac that was interacting with the USS Nimitz at Carrier Group, mm -hmm. did you think that's ours? We built that? Do you find it likely? That was... Uh, what? 2004. Yeah. It could be. I mean, it, it, it could be ours or extraterrestrial. Uh, it's difficult to say. You know? Do you think it's possible we have made that breakthrough? Somebody? Oh, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, those kind of craft. Where is it? Uh, well, they have a lot of these, uh, so to speak, in space, from what I understand. Uh, Gary McKinnon was hacking the uh, Space Command website, and, uh, uh, which is under the Air Force and found ship-to-ship -ship, uh, uh, transfer logs where crew members were being transferred to other ships. And he says he checked and these weren't ships on Earth. Uh, Do you think that we, we could have built these things not based on reverse engineering someone else's technology, but doing it on our own, figuring it out on our own? Some of it, yeah. Well, Townsend Brown, uh, yeah. based on his own inspiration and genius, he developed uh, thrusters. And I believe those are today used, well, his uh, flying uh, disc idea is he kept developing it until he got 10 foot diameter discs. And then you find the technology shows up in the B-2 bomber. And the way you know that is he took out a patent on it. And you compare his patents to what was leaked about the B-2 bomber. So for sure, that's the realization of his technology. and. Uh, he also had vertical thrusters, and so it's possible in the wing they might have these vertical thrusters that help it to levitate. So besides just propel it, they could also keep it. Can you give me the thumbnail sketch of your presentation at this conference? Yeah, well, in the beginning I talk about the Project Skyvolt, how we got these craft up there to create our fleet. Apparently we have a whole fleet up there. It's totally a this secret program. And they supposedly will hopefully disclose what we've got up there. <laughs> then I want to get into uh, talking about our legacy of this physics that was handed to us through our myths and astrology and tarot. It, they're sort of symbolically encoded in these lores. Uh, and it comes from thousands of years ago. Uh, and uh, I believe it's originated its extraterrestrial origin. Now, I developed my physics based on general systems theory, physics, and concepts uh, that we that developed out of science. And it was only later that I realized, hey, and I'm recognizing these concepts in first uh, Babylonian creation epic, then in the myth of Zeus creating the universe, uh, the ancient Egyptian stories of Atum and Osiris. And they are sort of coded uh, explanations of how the first particle of matter came into being. And, and this physics, you don't have a Big Bang. You have continuous creation. And the universe is infinite. It's ether-based. And particles emerge out of fluctuations in the ether, sort of like ZPG, zero-point energy. Uh, and uh, this physics, it's sort of like, <coughs> basically, I found a genetic code, I believe, for the universe. In fact, we're simulating. We have groups simulating this. And past, uh, one fellow has simulated on his laptop the equations and produced a particle. Shows how a particle can emerge like a neutron. And the uh, field pattern of that matches exactly what they later found. Uh, well, actually, uh, I, uh, what I had predicted it would look like before they actually found it with particle scattering experiments it verified my earlier predictions and then his later simulations verified what I had said. God made man in, you know, in his image. So when you read the cuneiform um, you find out that that's true that we were made in his image but it was created through genetic manipulation. 
and so, it just makes sense. So how mm -hmm. does that story go? You said you were raised in the church. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, Christian, Catholic. Pro I was raised in a Protestant, you right. know, Protestant Christianity. So how does this version of reality go over with with your? Uh, it doesn't go over well with <laughs> my church peeps because I still, I mean, I, I I was Protestant. I was baptized Baptist. My wife was Catholic. My kids have been baptized Catholic, um, but. And I still raise them in the church. We still go to church, but I just don't discuss this with my church people there. You know, um, actually, one of the ladies that found out that I wrote this book is very upset with me. Uh, she's older, and um, she can't believe that I wrote this book. So. I've seen these arguments about uh, people who want um, intelligent design to be taught in schools, and you know, in, in conversations that I've had with people, I said, "Well, be careful what you wish for, because." Intelligent design, the designer might be someone you're not expecting. Right. Who do you think right. these people are? Uh, I believe Sitchin talked about the Anunnaki. Right. And the cuneiform tablets do say that. So I follow Dr. Andrew George uh, and Dr. Irving Finkel, which are probably the premier scholars uh, dealing with the cuneiform writings today. Uh, I read all of Sitchin's books. I can compare the two. I know where they differ. I know where they're the same. Um, and then I cover that in my book. So there are so. disagreements on, on who the Anunnaki were, and, and there are some disagreements on, on uh, interpretation of uh, the ancient writings. Right. Um, but you think, in general, they came from somewhere else, manipulated our genetics, used us for slave labor? Right. Yes, sir. Yep. It's just God and the angels are aliens. And basically all the gods of every civilization are based on these beings that originally came. I mean, pretty much every religion you, you can name has somebody coming from the sky. Right. They have their, and they have their similarities. I mean, even the Vedics, you know, you got Brahma, Vishnu, and, and Shiva are their basic similarities to uh, the Anunnaki of Anu, Enki, and Enlil. You can say the same with the Norse. You know, you, you have uh, Odin, uh, Thor, and Loki, which are also almost direct, you know, very similar to the Sumerians again, Anu, Enki, and Enlil. So, and, and you can find these similarities in every civilization of, of every god pantheon. Sitchin found himself being beaten up everywhere he looked. I mean, not physically beaten up, but are you ready to go down that road? Uh, yes, because this is what most people don't understand about Sitchin. Um, they think that when he gave his uh, explanation of the Enuma Elish, which is the seven tablets uh, of the cuneiform that cover the creation myth, right? Um, they think it's a direct translation, but really that's not what he was giving. He was giving his interpretation of what he translated. So when it's not, if it doesn't match up with the scholars say, they say that, oh, Sitchin was a fraud. Sitchin was... Uh, he made it all up. He didn't make it all up. He was given his interpretation because what he saw in the Enuma Elish was a metaphor for the celestial gods in the formation of our solar system. Um, and I think he was on to something. Um, did he get everything 100% correct? Who knows? We don't know. Uh, I've been a UFO investigator actually since 1980, and I got involved with uh, UFO illustration. My background is I was a commercial artist, and I met a UFO investigator in Tucson at that time who was a retired Air Force lieutenant colonel. And he had been investigating flying saucers and UFOs for 20 years in 1980. He had the world's largest collection of UFO photographs and archive. And he was Lieutenant Colonel Wendell C. Stevens. And through my association with him, I started supplying illustrations for his investigations. So this is in 1980, and this one thing has evolved from another to another to another to where I find myself involved with UFO conferences. Wendell had the first international UFO conference in 1991 in Tucson. And that was in the spring of 91. Bob Brown became associated with Wendell Stevens in the fall of that year, and they had their first conference in Las Vegas. Okay, so one thing has led to another, and 
here we are in 2020, and I'm still doing UFO conferences with Bob Brown, trying to get this information out to the general public, and that maybe the UFO topic is not as woo-woo and as crazy as has been, you know, whitewashed. And so with my artwork and so forth and my research, it's like trying to get this out to the public in uh, alternative media. And so here I am. And how do you think that's going over the past few years, getting it out to the public? Well, since 1991, it's been an uphill struggle, very much an uphill struggle. But now it's like with with alternative media and so forth, it's it's almost the, oversaturated with UFO information. You know, we have ancient aliens and all these TV programs and Hollywood movies. It's like, I never dreamed it would be become as proliferated as it is now. And of course, thanks to KLAS TV and George Knapp and his brilliant um, uh, documentaries about this has given credibility to this subject that uh, was not there when we first started. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and I mean, what, what do you get out of coming to a conference like this? Well, it's on multiple levels. Um, of course, we like to get paid for being here as a speaker, and we I, and I love selling my artwork here. But what more more than that, what's really much more rewarding is contact is talking to people face to face. You can't believe the personal stories that are shared to us at these conferences. You have no idea. It's like how broad based the UFO phenomenon is within our population. I never dreamed. I never dreamed when I first got involved with this. I thought it was very hit and miss and very scattered across. But it's... And being in a position as a UFO investigator and being in a public venue like this, you have the general public come in here and it's like they realize that you are their confessor. I can tell you my story, but I can't tell my wife, I can't tell my brother, I can't tell my parents, I can't tell my sister. They'll all think I'm crazy, but I can tell you my story and feel safe. And I've experienced that for the last 40 years, and I, it's, just, it's just blown my mind. I can't believe how broad-based this phenomenon really is. And it's, and it's more than nuts and bolts. This is, this is paranormal phenomena. And I know that's, that's a woo-woo term that it's not accepted publicly, but I'm sorry, this paranormal is a reality. And it's like, the population needs to be re-educated to where it's okay to admit that. And even the government's like, <gasps> we can't talk about that, but I'm sorry, it's time. If you want disclosure, you're going to have to face this reality. So I'm preaching here, but whatever. <laughs> That's okay. Um, tell me a little bit, maybe more about the artwork. Um, have you always kind of been an artist your whole life? How did I mean? You kind of said how you got involved in it, um, but what has you know made you continue all these years? Well, you know, I'm a kid of the '50s, so I grew up with television. I grew up with visual media. So it's like my parents' generation; they read books. I watched movies. I watched television. So every, visual media has been you know, my bread and butter. And so um, when I got into college, I wanted to become an illustrator, an artist. But I got drafted, I got drafted. So I didn't get to finish college. But while I was in the service, I took a correspondence course in commercial art and completed it. So when I got out of the service, I said, I'm gonna be, an art I'm gonna be the world famous artist. <sighs> and so I did, I, and, and, and it's, the artistry for me is not is was not academic. It was like you want to be an artist, you know, buy the paints, buy the brushes, and get and, and start working. And so, I'm essentially self-taught as an artist with a background in commercial art. So my artwork is very photorealistic. The other thing is like I've always wanted to have a, a flying saucer encounter. I've always wanted to see a real deal flying saucer, and I have never done that. But as an artist, I can do it vicariously. So, so many of these are, uh, it, my illustrations are, are based on actual accounts, actual stories. And it's like, what would it be like if I was there experiencing that with the contactee? 
with the abductee and then put that into a, a work of art so everybody can experience. And what's beautiful is this communicates to people all over the world. There's no language barrier. People look in the art and they instantly can communicate with this. They instantly understand it. No language barrier. It's like, so it's, it's been a real gift. It's been a challenge, but it's been also a great, a great communication tool. And it's and a, a connecting with people. And, and then being in a, in a context like this where I can see how people react to it. And people will walk up, oh, I saw a UFO just like that back in California, right? It's like, see, it, we're communicating here, and, it, and, it's, and it's on a visceral level, and it's like, it's extraordinary. Well, I've been studying the stars all my life, you know, and where do UFOs and ETs and extraterrestrials resonate from? <laughs> the you, stars. Do you see that there's a lot of spillover of interest for the people who come here to hear about UFOs? Are they also interested in I astrology? think so, I think so, because everyone has a birthday and everyone knows their birth sign, you know? So if it's true, the history of UFOs, uh, we have a connection to the stars, you know, they come from different star systems, there, there has to be some sort of connection with astrology. And in the course of doing a reading for uh, in their astrological charts, do you uh, find out information about oh, yeah. them? Oh, yeah. Encounters? And oh, yeah. Like that? I, I'm very intuitive. I've, I've been doing this a long time, 40 years, and I could tell, look at someone and kind of get a sense of where they may resonate with or what entity or beings or whatever they are, uh, you know, they're from. What are the kinds of things, profound things, that you've figured out from reading their charts that you've conveyed to them that floors them? Uh, usually childhood memories, things that no one else knows that I seem to know. And whether it comes through astrology or it comes through intuition, uh, that surprises them. But most of the clients are looking for some sort of direction in life. So I, I give them information that they're going to need in the near future. You know, it's like the stars are able to tell us what the cycles are and, and how they're going to align. So it benefits them greatly to know what's coming. I've seen this giant spike in interest in UFOs and UFO related yep. issues, yep. New York Times, all that stuff. Does something similar happen to astrology because of that? Oh, I think it will, absolutely, because they go hand in hand. Um, you know, everyone's looking for answers these days, whether it's UFOs or just uh, awareness of understanding of what's happening. And we astrologers have been able to, you know, help the community or help the world at large understand the cycles, because that's all astrology is, is understanding you, cycles. Do you think they are here? Uh, I think we are here. <laughs> and they have influence or uh, they've been here for thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, either underground bases, in reality, many of them look like us, <laughs> you know. Have you met any? Uh, not personally, not personally, but I've met people that you could just tell there's something different about them and that they just don't either belong here or they resonate with another galaxy somewhere, <laughs> you know, so.